Welcome back to my channel, YouTube. Listen, we're going to hop right in today. OK, you already know who I am. We're not going to talk about that. If you're just joining and you haven't seen my previous videos, go check them out. I'm going to leave one right here and, and the next one will play right away. So we are going over the basics today. I really want to talk about kitchen food and safety. This is a big topic. It changes from kitchen to kitchen, from state to state, from country to country. But I want to give you a basic feeling of where I stand on as far as food kitchen safety, which I think is pretty reasonable across the world. This is the book that I am referring to. This is the ninth edition of the CIA. I am going to read directly from the book because I think it's best, especially for everyone that is out there to get the piece of literature. I recommend buying the book, but you don't have to. There's a PDF link below. You can follow right along. This is going to be food kitchen and safety chapter four. And the first thing we're going to talk about is foodborne illness. Now, if you're in America, there's this thing called Serve Safe. They have Serve Safe um, certificate and they also have Serve Safe manager. If you're going to be a food handler, you need to get this certification. And if you already have that certification, you can just skip this part, okay? Unless you want to freshen up. First things first, foodborne illness. Now, there are tons of ways to avoid this. Now, trust me, I've worked in a lot of operations from breakfast to lunch to dinner, high volume restaurants, fine dining restaurants. And I'll be honest, it's the Michelin rated restaurants that have the highest standards. Does that mean that I won't go to Taco Bell right now? No. But the thing is, is as a chef, when you're coming up in the kitchen, it's better to start with good habits to avoid foodborne illness. So let's hop right in. Food pathogens. The specific types of pathogens responsible for foodborne illness are fungi, viruses, parasites, and bacteria. Fungi or fungi, which is molds and yeast, are more adoptable than other microorganisms and have a high tolerance for acidic conditions. They are more often responsible for food spoilage than for foodborne illness. Beneficial fungi are important to the food industry because that's what creates cheese, bread, wine, and beer. Viruses do not actually multiply in food, but if through poor sanitation practices, a virus contaminates food consumption of that food may result in illness. I'm not going to go into the rest of it. When you go to the bathroom, you need to wash your hands properly. And trust me, I know this is going to be hard for some people, but I've seen a lot of people in the restaurant business not wash their hands after they go to the bathroom. I know this sounds crazy to say, but if you see somebody not wash their hands after going to the bathroom properly, you need to call them out right away because this is how foodborne illness happens. I'm telling you, practicing personal hygiene. This is really important. Also, another way that people get sick is uh, we'll get into right now. I I want to talk about this pathogen real quick because this can be avoided. OK, unless it comes from the food directly. But usually in what I've seen in my experience is foodborne illness is directly from the human. It's not from the food. It's crazy because they say foodborne illness, but it's more common that people get sick because of a virus from a poor hygiene. Trust me, I know it sounds crazy, but this is just my personal experience. I want to read straight from the literature, but I'm also talking about my chef experience, you know, especially like in Las Vegas and Los Angeles, where the health department is, you know, they're on fire. They're all over you. We'll get into more. Bacteria require three basic conditions for growth and reproduction, a protein source, readily available moisture and time. The higher amount of protein in food, the greater its potential as a carrier for foodborne illness. The amount of moisture available in the food is measured in the water activity. OK, and we're not going to get into too much of that, but it's just important that I read the first section of that basic conditions for growth. Many foods provide three conditions necessary for bacterial growth and therefore are considered to be potentially hazardous. Meats, poultry, seafood, tofu, and dairy products, with the exemption of some hard cheeses. All are categorized as potentially hazardous foods. Foods not necessarily have to be animal based to contain protein. However, vegetables and grains also contain protein. Cooked rice, beans, pasta, potatoes are therefore potentially hazardous foods. They are also unlikely candidates that are ripe for bacterial growth, such as sliced melons, sprouts, garlic and oil mixtures. Think about this as a chef. When you're setting up the line, you want to check the cooked food, the raw product. You're not going to be in the dry storage checking the nuts for foodborne illness. No, that is what that means to me. OK, so just make sure cheese, dairy, the dairy's not spoiled. Make sure the cooks on the line are doing the right thing or you as the cook are setting up the station properly. If you see something that looks off, make sure you contact a manager or make sure you say something. Although cooking food will destroy many of microorganisms present, careless food handling after cooking can reintroduce pathogens that will grow even more quickly without competition for food space from microorganisms that cause spoilage. Although shortcuts and carelessness do not always result in foodborne illness, inattention to detail increases the risk 
of creating an outbreak that may cause serious illness or even death. The various kinds of expenses related to an outbreak of foodborne illness, such as negative publicity and loss of prestige, are blows from which many restaurants cannot recover. Again, this is page 33. I skipped a few paragraphs that I, I didn't think were really essential, but please do your due diligence. These rules are never going to change. Know this. No food safety. You have to. It's imperative to be a professional cook. And even when you're at home, like that's why you, you hear some people like, oh, I don't want to cook at so-and-so's house, you know, because trust me, I've been over to people's house before. Even if it's one of my homies cutting the meat, you know, he goes to, you know, drop a deuce and then he comes back and he continues to just cook. Like this is the disconnect from a professional cook to a home cook, right? Next up, avoid cross-contamination. I will ride this home because cross-contamination is the biggest culprit in restaurants. Good example. If I'm slicing raw meat on a cutting board and somebody comes over to slice a sandwich that's ready to eat, that's a big no-no. If you are at your house, you can do whatever you want, but I highly recommend you practice what you preach at work. For that reason, I have three different cutting boards at the house, right? I don't even risk it. One is for meat, one is for vegetables, one is for ready to eat food. Do you have to do that? No, but I think it's a good practice. So if you are going to cut a piece of meat or chicken or whatever on a cutting board, you need to wash, sanitize, and dry that properly before you use it for anything else. So what's the better idea? Get two cutting boards. They're less than 20 bucks, like seriously, and you avoid that. Okay, avoid cross-contamination. Many foodborne illnesses are a result of unsanitary handling procedures in the kitchen. Cross-contamination occurs when a disease-causing elements or harmful substance are transferred from one contaminated surface to another. Excellent personal hygiene is one of the best defenses against cross contamination. An employee who reports for work with a contagious illness or infected cut on his hands puts every customer at risk. Anytime the hands come in contact with a possible source of contamination, the face, the hair, the eyes, the mouth, they must thoroughly wash before continuing any work. Food is at the greatest risk of cross-contamination during the preparation stage. Ideally, separate work areas and cutting boards should be used for raw and cooked foods. Equipment and cutting boards should always be cleaned thoroughly and sanitized between uses. All food must be stored carefully to prevent contact between raw and cooked items, place strip pans beneath raw foods, do not handle ready to eat foods with bare hands. Instead, use suitable utensils or single use gloves. Ever since COVID hit, gloves have been a part of my life. And you know, I feel weird if I don't have them on and I'm touching food. Ready to eat foods, you need gloves. If the food is gonna be cooked, you do not need gloves. Keep in mind that this is never gonna change. This is gonna be instilled in us, especially in America here. The other two things I wanna to touch on really quickly and then we can elaborate. If you have any questions or comments, you wanna leave them down below and I will be more than happy to respond to them because I think what's really important is giving you the cliff notes, do the research on yourself because a lot of this stuff, I hate to say it's common sense, but you know, you have to say it. I don't have time to explain things, so I think it's best if I explain it now and then refer back to this video. Keeping foods out of the danger zone. There are pathogens that can live at all temperature ranges. For the most, of capable causing foodborne illness, the friendliest environment provided temperatures with the range of 41 to 135, okay? That's uh, Fahrenheit. Five degrees Celsius to 57 degrees Celsius is the danger zone. Most pathogens are either destroyed or will not reproduce at temperatures above 135. F or 57C. Storing foods at a temperature below 41F or 5C will slow or interrupt the cycle of reproduction. It should also be noted that intoxicating pathogens may be destroyed during cooking, but any toxins they haven't produced are still there. So what's really important is the time temperature danger zone, okay? So it's counterintuitive because some proteins you wanna serve in the danger zone. It's up to you as the cook to make sure that protein is properly sourced, that you know how long it's been out for, you know where it came from, you know how it was handled. You don't wanna eat a piece of fish that is 150 degrees, it's going to be horrible, but at the same time, it will be safe. Take in consideration the time temperature danger zone. All cold items below 41, anything that's served hot needs to be above 135. Proteins are subjective. So a good example of that is you'll see on every single menu, it says a little disclaimer that talking about undercooked, you know, proteins eat at your own risk. And that's the reason why. We're gonna talk about cooling foods to safety, and then we're gonna talk about thawing frozen foods and serving food safely. I don't wanna talk about holding like holding cooked foods as chefs and leaders. We all, we all need to avoid this. Get away from steam tables, okay? 
they suck. But anyway, cooling food safely. One of the leading causes of foodborne illness is improperly cooled foods. Cooked foods that are to be stored need to be cooled below 41 F and 5 C as quickly as possible. This should be completed within four hours. Unless you're using the two-stage cooling method in the first stage, this method foods must be cooled to 70 F or 21 C within two hours. Then the second stage, the foods must be reached 41 F or 5 C or below within the additional four hours for a total cooling time of six hours, according to FDA guidelines. Using the two-stage method quickly moves the food through a part of the danger zone where the bacteria grows most rapidly. The proper way to cool hot liquids is to place them in a metal container and ice water and bath that reaches the same level as the liquid inside the container. Stir the liquid in the container frequently so the warmer liquid at the center mixes with the cooler liquid at the outer edge of the container, bringing down the overall temperature more rapidly. Semi-solid and solid foods should be refrigerated in a single layer in shallow containers to allow greater surface exposure to the cold air. For some reason, large cuts of meat or other foods should be cut into smaller portions, cooled to room temperature, and wrapped before refrigerating. This is a great point. I'm not going to spend too much time on here to cool things down properly. And I see this big problem with people cooking at home. You know, they're not cooling things down properly or they take a big, you know, if you have your crock pot, for example, you don't want to take your crock pot and put that whole thing in the fridge. Trust me, it's no good. You need to cool it down outside. If something is steaming, lay it in a container that's flat so it can get to room temperature as quick as possible. Then you put it into your fridge. If you put something hot into your fridge, it's gonna bring the total temperature of the fridge up. Unless you have a powerful fridge or a walk-in at your house, it's not the same. So just keep that in mind when you're cooking at home. Next, thawing frozen foods safely. I want to read from the book, but I'm going to talk about it because it's really easy, actually. So thawing frozen foods safely, this is a really important one because sometimes it's done incorrectly. Now, there's two ways to go about it. One is not really e economical, but it takes a long time, and that is let it thaw in the refrigerator. If you know that you're going to need meat or whatever it is the next day for your station or whatever it is you're going to need it for, pull it out the day before and let it thaw under refrigeration. This is the best way to do it. Now, sometimes we don't always have that time. So the next option would be to pull it out and put it in water under cold running water with a constant drizzle and keep the water circulating. But the thing is, is then you're wasting water. So it kind of, you know, is bad. What's the third option? Leave it out at room temperature on the counter. No, I highly don't recommend this if you are in a restaurant or a professional cook. If you're at home, it's a different story, right? You can do whatever you want. You know, if you want to get yourself sick, it's great. But when you're cooking for other people, you need to have a different mindset. Do things properly. This is a big difference between cooking for your family at your house and cooking for other people in a restaurant environment. Serving food safely. The potential to transmit foodborne illness does not end when the food leaves the kitchen. Restaurant servers should also be instructed in good hygiene and safe food handling practices. Hands should be properly washed after using the restroom, eating, smoking, touching one's face or hair, and handling money. Dirty dishes or soiled table linens when setting tables Never touch parts of the flatware that come in contact with food and handle glassware by the stems or bases only. Carry plates, glasses, flatwares in such a way that food contact surfaces are not touched. Serve all foods using the proper utensils, okay? Self-explanatory, I've seen this way too many times, especially when handling other people's food. Make sure you're not touching it. Scrape it off into the dish area. Do the best you can, okay? Even as a cook, when you are handling the plates, remember the plate is going to somebody to consume. You are the last line of defense for foodborne illness. So just keep that in mind. You know, if something happens, do the right thing. If something falls on the floor, throw in the garbage. Do not serve it, okay? Because you don't know what could happen. You don't know what it touched. Get rid of it, okay? It's not worth it. As a chef, I would much rather tell the guest, hey, we accidentally dropped this, okay? We're making a, a new one right now. Then to serve them that with knowing that it hit the floor. It's horrible. Don't do that. Also, keep in mind if, you know, uh, some sweat drops down into a plate or into a bowl of french fries, get rid of it, okay? I've seen this happen before where I saw a cook cutting pizza and they're cutting the pizza and the, they're, you know, they're sweating and it dribbles onto the freaking pizza right on top. And they literally pretended like nothing even happened. And I was like, okay, that pizza's trash and you need to remake it. Cleaning and sanitizing, most important thing. Cleaning refers to the removal of soil or food particles, whereas sanitizing involves using moist heat 
or chemical agents to kill pathogenic microorganisms for equipment that cannot be immersed in the sink or for equipment such as knives and cutting boards employed during food preparation using a wiping cloth soaked in double string sanitizer solution to clean and sanitize between uses. All right, so there's plenty of different sanitizers. I'm not gonna get into that, but small equipment, tools, pots, and tableware should be run through a wear washing machine or wash manually in a three compartment sink after sanitizing equipment and tableware should be allowed to dry. As you become a professional, you need to make sure your area is clean, you are clean, your tools and the machines that you use are cleaned every time you use them. Do the right thing. I've been in restaurants where it's the cooks that use the blenders and use the RoboCube and use certain machines. You need to leave it better than you found it. Like I tell everybody, if you make something and you know, it's, let's say you make tomato soup and you get tomato soup all over the blender and you put the blender away dirty, right? Well, then that tomato soup sticks there. And then the next cook gets it. He makes something else. My rule of thumb was wipe down the blender every single time you use it with sanitizer, unless you obviously get something crazy on there that you have to scrub off. Every time you sanitize the machine after you're finished using it, because just doing that keeps it in pristine shape, right? So I think that's really important. That's going to be it for today. Thanks a lot for watching. I'll see you next week.